Welcome everyone to this discussion with Andrew Turner, CBDC Strategy Specialist at FIS, to talk about the implications, opportunities and challenges of rolling out retail central bank digital currencies in Europe. I'm John Orchard, OMFIS CEO. And it's nice to talk to you today, Andy. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, John. Nice to be here. Uh, we know that uh, the ECB has set up a five-year work stream to consider uh, implementing a digital euro um, while they consult with market participants, um, retail and wholesale stakeholders, regulators, policymakers, governments and so forth. Uh, retail CBDCs bring quite a lot of technical complexity, as we often hear in our sessions, uh, as well as important social and economic issues uh, which need looking at. Uh, and we'll look at those uh, ourselves in a minute. Do you think, Andy, that the ECB and other European central banks should launch retail CBDCs um, to promote monetary sovereignty and indeed digitalization? In short, yes. Um, we at FIS believe CBDC can advance the future of money and help nations become digital first economies. Uh, we have developed a CBDC sandbox for central banks and that is integrated with our real-time payments clearing and settlement system to allow central banks um, in Europe or globally to simulate and access different use cases and models. Um, this sandbox, importantly, allows central bankers new monetary policy tools and real-time data for central bankers and governments around the world to make more effective decisions on monetary and physical uh, policy. I think, importantly, with the decision for European um, national central banks and the ECB, um, is you know, CBDC is not just making cash digital. Uh, CBDC can importantly bring new features and functionalities and can address future payment needs. At FIS, I think we've seen a real increase in central bank activity um, in terms of different pilots and initiatives. And I think that's in part down to COVID, as well as the rise of private cryptocurrencies and stable coins. Um, I believe, and FIS believes, central banks will launch CBC as a safe alternative means of payment and store of value. And if, if a retail CBC is properly managed, it can help nations uphold financial stability and monetary stability and preserve just, their currency. Uh, just to go back to your sandbox very briefly, Andrew, I know uh, lots of central banks are listening to this today uh, and they'll be interested in the uh, in the details of your project, you touch on an issue that's important to them, I know, which is essentially the collection of information. Uh, and I know that uh, uh, some of the DLT revolutionaries, as we might call them, are, are getting a bit stuck on this. Could you tell us a little bit more about uh, your information tools in your sandbox? I think they'd find that valuable. Sure. So we're looking at different reporting, real-time data of, you know, the general economy. So I think it's important if we're going to go to a digital first economy powered by CBDCs. Governments, central bankers should have more information at their hands. In the sandbox, we are trying to allow central bankers see the aggregation of data to make better decisions going forward. Um, there are already uh, a number of retail pilots um, operating, including a major one, of course, uh, with the People's Bank of China. Uh, and one or two other developing economies, we think perhaps of the uh, experiment in the Bahamas. Uh, what lessons uh, are we learning from these, Andrew, and uh, how should that inform the design for the optimal uh, retail CBDC, do you think? I think looking at these different pilots and early initiatives, we should look at when we design a CBDC to address those domestic conditions and policy objectives. So with any kind of future implementations or pilots, there needs to be a clear focus. We know central banks are learning from one another initiatives and from the BIS and sharing different ideas on different technologies. I, but I think central banks as well need to examine their domestic payment landscape, consider different pain points, the gaps and what future innovation they want to bring for their markets. I think central banks can also learn from the latest innovations in payments and some of the answers on topics like offline payments can be supported by looking at what we do today um, in, in just not general payments. CBDC must be designed with the user at the centre. So it's all good doing local policy objectives, but we need to, you know, put human centred design, understanding how to make the CBDC user friendly um, and accessible. 
What key challenges do central banks need to overcome to launch the CBDC? We certainly heard a range from technology through to financial stability, um, uh, through to uh, regulation and supervision. Uh, wh where do you see the real challenges, Andrew? So if we launch a CBDC, it's, it's mission critical infrastructure. At FIS, we have our real net central product, which is an account to account uh, clearing and payment systems for real-time real payments and central infrastructure. As with any implementation, there's an enormous amount of work. So even up front, the technology and design decisions which need to be made are huge. Um, and then there will be a key challenge of integrating CBC with existing payments landscape, whether that's the RTGS, whether it's the account to account I've mentioned, as well as the banking and payment engines. Um, and we at FIS have banking platforms. So it's a holistic uh, landscape of payment engines, banking engines, payment systems, and RTGS integration and account to account integration as well. Apart from the technology and design, uh, you know, there's a large educational campaigns each country will need to pursue. Uh, we saw with Chip and Pin an enormous uh, campaign, both for uh, retailers and the general population. Uh, we may have to do more in terms of promoting digital literacy. Uh, what, what factors do you think will influence uh, adoption of CBDC, Andrew? We've seen in our sessions perhaps a, uh, a rush uh, to look at retail CBDC off the back of the threat from uh, stable coins. Uh, then it slightly settled down as the US regulator uh, got involved uh, and pushed that back a bit. Uh, and then we've seen concerns, of course, about the collapse in the use of cash, uh, thanks to uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, and then there are other issues around the sovereignty of money that I mentioned right at the beginning. What are the factors that you think will influence the adoption of CBDC? So in the retail space, uh, because it's for the general public, households, businesses, uh, the, the adoption will be influenced by the design and the perceived benefits. When central banks are designing CBCs, they need to remember that this is for the population. So it's going to be means of payment. And today that is determined by convenience, um, as well as other things, you know, cost, speed, and whether that payment mechanism or type is viewed as safe and secure. I think to make CBDC compelling, we need to think of new features and functionalities. Uh, adoption will, you know, if there's innovative use cases, if there's programmability, adoption will be higher. And of course, um, CBDC needs to be legal tender and widely accepted. If CBDC is easy for users, merchants, businesses to set up and use, uh, and there's real innovation in terms of being the next format of money, I think adoption will take off. Um, what concerns might uh, users have? On the one hand, we've seen a huge increase in contactless payments. Uh, on the other, uh, we occasionally pick up a certain uh, conservatism in certain markets. Um, where, where might you see concerns for users? So in some countries, some users are more concerned about privacy. So I would say the debate on privacy often gets lost because obviously it's not going to be as anonymous as cash because it can't be. We've got AML checks, uh, you know, terrorist anti-money laundering checks to do. Uh, and today we see, you know, in most markets, consumers are doing electronic payments and certain data is disclosed. I think we as a community need to convince uh, the general public that this isn't an Orwellian concept. And we need to put people's mind at rest that CBDC, in those transactions, only data is disclosed, which needs to be to you know, specific individuals. Um, I think we also need to continue to educate the general public. Many have not heard about CBDC, and if they have, they think it's the same as cryptocurrency. So there's still a large edu educational piece there. Yeah, would you, you would expect the privacy component of physical cash to be replicated to some extent up to a certain value, say, within reason? In some markets, yes, but that might not be appropriate for all markets. There's interesting research that needs to be done um, regarding the shadow economy. And I know a number of central banks are looking, you know, they're seeing the benefits of CBDC in terms of having that traceability, 
maybe it's not the central bankers, but it's to you know stop fraud, protect consumers, and I think we can get the right mix of privacy uh, for you know there might be different user types, as you said, people may be able to transact to us, uh, transact up to a certain limit, but I think we need to leave this for governments working with um, the central banks as well. Yeah, it's a social and regulatory challenge as much as a technical one that. Uh, uh, um, uh, governments, as you say, need to consider as much as anyone as anyone else. Um, in the central banks that uh, we talk to, when we ask them when they're going to phase out physical cash, uh, they often say never um, in order to look after particularly aging members of the population who might not have smartphones and so forth. And so there does seem to be some concern about the inclusivity of this kind of technology. How can a retail CBDC be inclusive, would you say, Andrew? So I think we should design CBDC with different user personas at, at the heart and include users, the general public, in the design. Um, one way maybe is to make it accessible. So there's different kind of accessibility testing we could do. There's physical cards with balances on. Um, there could be digital literacy campaigns, which I mentioned earlier. I also think having done some work with the UK government on unbanked people in the country um, you, you know we people often like to use cash to as a budgeting means so technology players like ourselves if we're designing wallets or accounts we need to give application features to replicate some of those budgeting features but go one step further so um, people can analyze their spending find new ways to save so I think we need to you know look at make a CBC inclusive and we mustn't lose the opportunity even in Europe um, to look at how we can promote financial inclusion often some of uh, the people who are unbanked it's because they don't trust the banks if we launch the next generation of money with CBC how can we close that gap uh, the budgeting point's interesting an interesting one actually we don't we don't hear that often but that is an important way that people use physical money. I mean, in its surveys, OMF has seen a wide um, variety of these retail attitudes to uh, to the potential introduction of CBDC uh, from, a, from a range of different markets. And there's quite a bit of enthusiasm, I think it's fair to say, countries, uh, for example, such as Nigeria uh, and Indonesia. Um, and there's scepticism, as we've already mentioned, in important jurisdictions uh, like uh, Germany, uh, but also the US. Uh, what uh, functionality and features do you think will make a retail CBDC successful, Andrew? I think we can learn a lot here from payments in general. We've seen, you know, huge adoptions, things like Apple Pay, Alipay, WeChat Pay. Uh, we need to kind of look at how those payment uh, new innovations are successful, whilst also understanding we're bringing a new format of money in as well. So I think for CBDC to be successful, it needs, you know, extensive work in each country. No two countries are the same to you know, understand what are the problems, what are the gaps, and what new features can we bring. Um, I would double down on making it as convenient as possible. You know, uh, users need to be able to easily set up their wallets. Uh, there needs to be low costs if that's for the merchants. Uh, there needs to be a whole range of devices supported. And finally, you just want an efficient and fast payment system. And, store of value going forward. Uh, thanks, Andrew. It's an exciting um, area. Uh, on the other hand, we shouldn't uh, run before we can walk. And I know there are uh, problems with the payments infrastructure um, as it stands. Uh, could you sketch out a couple of those, please, uh, first as well? Sure. Not all countries have real-time payment systems. Uh, so we've got, as I mentioned, RealNet Central, which is implemented in different jurisdictions globally. Uh, for you know to, to run your real-time payments clearing bulk payments but a lot of countries need to either modernize or introduce real-time payments or improve their batch um, as we used to call it you know the bulk payment systems often those technologies those infrastructures are outdated they might be monolithic there might be uh, you know, concerns with resilience so I think as long uh, with the, along with the CBCs, we need to look at upgrading those systems or introducing real-time payments. And many um, systems still in Europe, you know, there's 
uh, the older ISO formats. Um, some countries are still relying on card networks for settlement. And we believe if we can offer an integrated product for both CBDCs, real-time payments, uh, clearing settlement, you know, you're getting the best of both worlds. And there's, you know, some nice features you can get in terms of uh, exchange of CBDC for account-to-account uh, -account payments as well. Uh, thank you, Andrew. It strikes me that FAS has understood that this is uh, socioeconomic as much as it is uh, a technical um, area. So um, good luck. Uh, we look forward to further conversations with you. And thank you very much for talking with us today.